Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we want to do a little bit of a deep dive into understanding the topic of shear strength of clays. Uh, a lot of the work and a lot of the things that we've talked about in our classes up to this point have focused on the shear strength of cohesionless or granular soils, but today we're going to focus primarily on our friend clay soil. Clay soil is really tricky and uh, thank goodness for clay soils because if it wasn't for clay soils most of us geotechnical engineers would probably be out of a job uh, because sands can largely be predictable and, and easier to work with but clays are a challenge and uh, Professor Bob Holtz once taught us in class once he said the the uh, ability to be able to accurately predict the shear strength behavior of a soil, particularly a clay soil, is one of the attributes that will really separate the um, amazing, outstanding geotechnical engineers from the mediocre geotechnical engineers. So let's, let's just dive in. And let's start with uh, looking at the drained strengths of clays. So what I have here are some plots of uh, some deviatoric stresses from a triax test. That's this sigma d uh, versus axial strain. And uh, right below it, we have some matching plots of volumetric strain. So changes in uh, how the, the sample either contracted or dilated. Uh, contracted or I'm sorry contracted or dilated there we go versus that same axial strain so if we start and we follow the path of say a very stiff highly over consolidated clay uh, we would see that the as we load that thing up with the deviator stress, it would eventually reach some peak. And after we peak, it would begin to soften and come down and then flatten out. Okay. Now, uh, this soil is a soil that has a Skempton A bar parameter that is less than zero, indicating that it's dilative. If it's dilative, that means that the volumetric strain, though it may initially drop, is uh, eventually going to increase and be positive saying that the soil is indeed dilating and increasing its volume and in, uh, in essence increasing its void ratio. Now conversely if we look at the other sample it might just have strain hardening behavior like so. That uh, is behavior that corresponds to a normally consolidated soil that has maybe an over consolidation ratio approximately equal to one or we might see uh, volumetric strain that uh, decreases indicating the soil is contractive. Now what lessons do we learn from these these uh, figures here? First we learned that over consolidated clays that have a negative Skempton A parameter are going to dilate. And if they're going to dilate, they're going to have a peak strength followed by strain softening behavior. Now conversely, normally consolidated clays or uh, clays that have an over consolidation ratio around one, they're going to have a Skempton A parameter that's greater than zero uh, in shear. And they're going to contract when we shear them. So they're going to show strain hardening behavior and they're going to um, lose volume, hence contract, when we shear them. Now the interesting thing is notice how at large strains, both the over-consolidated and the normally consolidated soils tend to converge at about the same shear strength, or the same strength. And what we see is at large strains, uh, regardless of whether the soil started over consolidated or normally consolidated, they're going to converge to that same strength and we're going to call that converged strength the critical strength of the soil. Now <clears throat> let's look and see what uh, if we were to plot then uh, more circle 
of a clay specimen that we were shearing, what it would look like. Now, if, if we were to plot a series of, or, or to perform a series of drained triaxial, consolidated drained triaxial tests at different confining stresses, our, our shear strength uh, or our shear envelope, more Coulomb failure envelope, would look something like this, where it would have a bend in it, and we'd have a bilinear portion. Now, the, the bend always is going to correspond right about with the soil's pre-consolidation stress. Now, you'll recall that the soil pre-consolidation stress is the largest effective stress that the soil has experienced in its, in its past. So, it, it remembers what that effective stress was. Now, uh, the interesting thing is, if we just look at the, the normally consolidated portion of the clay, so those are the stresses greater than the pre-consolidation stress. If we consolidate our sample to a stress greater than the pre-consolidation stress and shear it, it's, it's going to be normally consolidated. And if we were to extend that failure envelope all the way down to the origin, we would see that it would cross the origin at, at a cohesion value of approximately zero. It might, it might not be exactly zero, but it's going to be very, very close. What that tells us is that in drained strengths, there really is no such thing as cohesion. When, when a soil is drained, uh, it, it's relying principally on the friction and uh, between the soil particles, and in this case, the clay sheets themselves. The, um, so, so cohesion, in essence, is, is kind of like a false source of strength. It, it relies more or is dependent more on the pore pressure effects from inside the soil. So it, it's more reliant on pore pressure. But the, the exception to this is if we have an over-consolidated clay, because what you're going to see is if we consolidate our soil to a stress that is less than the pre-consolidation pressure, so hence the soil is over-consolidated, it would have a failure envelope of this friction angle. And it would have some level of cohesion uh, present in it. And so, so to say that all cohesion is false is, is not true. Um, there is cohesion. The cohesion is typically associated with over-consolidated soils. So for over-consolidated clays, we will see cohesion. But then again, right at the pre-consolidation stress, we're going to see our failure envelope change uh, to the drained uh, friction angle of that soil. So, a couple of things to consider here and remember. The slope of the more Coulomb failure envelope changes in the zone of overconsolidation. It changes such that we now have cohesion apparent in the soil. Okay. Uh, here's a plot that uh, is really useful to engineers in practice. It's a plot that I really like. Now what this shows is the typical ranges of psi, the, uh, the effective psi, in clay-based mineralogy. Now you may be thinking, what in the world is psi? Uh, psi, if you'll remember, is the, um, this is the friction angle that, uh, or this is the failure envelope angle that corresponds in PQ space. So if I have a plot here of uh, P and I have a plot of Q, I'm going to have some sort of failure envelope where that uh, intercept might be equal to M and this angle is going to equal psi. Okay, so remember that corresponds to the failure envelope of the tops of the Mohr circle. So it's, it's not where the circle is tangent to that envelope that it fills, but it's where it, um, it uh, the circle, the top of the circle touches that envelope. And the relationship between psi and the traditional uh, friction angle phi is given in this relationship right here.
So this figure here shows us uh, some the typical ranges of that uh, failure envelope in PQ space. Okay, what do we learn? We learned that this region right through here is where we tend to see quartz space sands. So it's a higher friction angle, or it's a higher failure envelope. And then we have kaolinite type clay minerals, then eolite type minerals, and then the high plasticity montmorillonite type minerals have the lowest angle uh, for their failure envelopes. Here's another chart that shows similar type of behavior. Uh, this time it's for the tangent of psi, which is just equal to uh, the sine of phi, uh, given to us by uh, Kenny, and it's published in the ASCE back in 1959. So this, all these data points come from uh, lots of different types of soil with different levels of activity, uh, whether it's greater than 0.75 or less than 0.75. Uh, and it's all plotted as a function of the plasticity index. So from this plot here, you can get sine of phi and, and come up with an estimate of your friction angle phi or get psi if you'd like. So uh, a lot of engineers ask me um, when they should use drained strengths when dealing with clays because typically in our undergraduate studies, we're always taught to treat clays as undrained and use undrained cohesion or undrained shear strengths and people wonder when would I ever want to use drain strengths. Well uh, using drain strengths is what we call an effective stress analysis. Okay, This is going to be used with clays for the following cases. Uh, one case is going to be if we ever want to evaluate the long-term stability of a slope or an embankment uh, another case is going to be if we ever want to look at the long-term stability of a dam or a levee where we have steady state seepage. Uh, so we know that water is flowing constantly through the soil, but that, that water has reached a steady state of seepage and it's not changing. So in that case, we'd want to use long-term conditions. Um, another might be uh, the critical case of if we have heavily overconsolidated soils and we would want to use the long-term effective stress uh, analysis for any heavily overconsolidated soil and the reason for that is overconsolidated soils dilate which means they have negative pore pressures in undrained conditions if they have negative pore pressures their strengths in undrained loading are temporarily higher than the strengths in drained loading. So uh, we want to always design for the lowest strength. So that's why we're going to use the drain strengths for heavily overconsolidated soils. But there's always a but. A big but in this condition is there's, there have been several case histories, some of them are now famous, in which slope failures have occurred over a long uh, period of loading in the long term despite the analysis showing that they had adequate shear strength in terms of um, effective friction angle and effective cohesion. So let's give one example of this. A famous landslide, a famous case history, it was published in 1955 by Henkel and Skempton. It's called the Jackfield Landslide. This occurred in England. Uh, you can see a picture of a home that was uh, damaged by this in the Manchester Guardian, uh, published in April 1950. Yeah, is that a 50 or 32? Maybe it's, I can't tell, 52. Yeah, 52, right there. Okay, so here's a little uh, cross-section of what the Jackfield landslide looks like. We have uh, roughly about 500 feet or so in terms of the length of the slide. The slide itself was about 17 feet thick from the ground surface down to the, the shear zone in the soil. And uh, it just slid down slope. The slope was at an angle of about 10 degrees and it slid right into this river, the River Severn. And it caused a lot of damage. I mean, there was a railroad on it. There was a highway road on it. 
Um, and uh, between 1951 and 1952, the road moved 60 feet, uh, which was incredible if you think about it. Now, during this period, the article notes that there was a lot of rainfall that was occurring. And um, the interesting thing is, and, and why this caused a lot of people to be confused, was if they did the analysis, here's some handwritten notes from a colleague of mine, Professor Travis Gerber, that I'm sharing with you. Uh, these uh, handwritten notes walk through the calculation of the strength of the soil. Now, the testing of the soil showed that uh, in its undisturbed state, in drained conditions, it had a drained cohesion of 150 PSF. And its Skempton A parameter was equal to negative 0.4. So, I mean, this thing, this thing was definitely heavily over-consolidated, okay? That, this soil here, it was definitely heavily over-consolidated. And it had a drain friction angle of 21 degrees. So if I want to look at the resisting shear strength of the soil, it's going to be equal to the cohesion plus the effective stress times the tangent of phi prime. So if we start plugging in our numbers, 150 times the tangent of 21, and we calculate the total stress for a, a depth of um, 17 feet and using the unit weight of the soil, and uh, looking at the pore pressures that were really non-existent in the soil, what we find is that um, the predicted resistance, the shear resistance, it was 580 pounds per square feet. Now, it was predicted that the driving stress was 400 pounds per square foot of stress. So if we calculate the factor of safety, that slope should have had a factor of safety of 1.45. That slope should not have moved. So people scratch their head over that. But here's some things that we have to consider. Because of all of the heavy rainfall that happened, that rain infiltrated into the soil. And, and as a crack started to develop, that water moved right down into that shear zone. And it wetted and softened the clay along that, that shear zone such that once the clay becomes softened, its cohesion goes down to zero. So it no longer had that cohesion of 150. So if I take out that 150 and just put in zero for that, but I keep the same friction angle, all of a sudden my uh, predicted shear resistance drops to about 430 pounds per square feet. So if I do the factor of safety, I'm getting closer and closer to a factor of safety of one. The moral of the story, folks, it is often wise, very wise for engineers to assume that the, uh, the cohesion for drained conditions or for effective stress analysis is equal to zero. It's always wise to assume that. We need to consider the possibility that the clay will soften, that we might have a progressive zipper type of failure, or that we might develop what's called a slick and slide within the clay. Now, a slick and slide is where uh, along the shear plane, the uh, clay particles come into alignment with one another. And uh, the, the clay essentially becomes dispersive right along that shear plane. So it becomes slippery. And the friction uh, along that slick and slide is much lower than in other places inside the clay. So the scary thing about over-consolidated clays is that they often will develop slick and slides. So if we have over-consolidated clays, it's not wise to always design to the peak strength of that clay. So uh, this, this picture, this figure shows uh, some behavior, some uh, shear strength behavior of clay softening and the development of slick and slide. So like I mentioned before, if we look at this figure down here, 
uh, during its peak, the, the soil may be flocculated and the particles all uh, interlocked and, and messy like this. But once the slick and slide develops along that shear plane, those particles line up and it becomes much more slippery along that plane. Okay. So if we look at these plots, what we have here is displacement versus shear stress applied. Uh, and we're just looking at like maybe um, direct simple shear uh, or direct shear maybe on, on, in this plot here. So what we would see is that there's always going to be a peak undisturbed strength if we have an over consolidated clay. But if we have a normally consolidated clay, we'll also get a peak, but it's going to be much lower than the over consolidated peak because the clay, the normally consolidated clay is softened. Now, if we extend out our loading all the way to maybe something big like 10 inches, we're going to see that both the over consolidated and the normally consolidated converge to the same residual shear strength and it's going to be much lower than uh, either the softened or the peak shear strengths. So if buckle your seat belts because what I'm telling you is that for clays we really have three friction angles. We have a friction angle that corresponds to the peak strength. We have a friction angle that corresponds to the normally consolidated softened strength and we have a friction angle that corresponds to the residual strength. And all of those are going to have different slopes. And they're going to result in uh, gradually lower and lower strengths. So your challenge as the geotechnical engineer is to know which one of those you should pick. So to help you, just keep this in mind the peak strength is always going to correspond to over consolidated clays. The particles are going to be more flocculated in that, in that state. Softened strengths are always going to correspond to normally consolidated clays or, or moistened clays. So in this instance, the clay particles are beginning to line themselves up. And residual strengths are always going to correspond to large shear strains. And these particles are aligned on a slip surface, which we call slick and sides. So here's some figures that uh, can be useful references for you in your consulting. Uh, these are drained friction angles for various clays of uh, different clay fractions, less than 20% clay, 20 to 45% clay, and more than 50% clay. That shouldn't, that should be this, more than, not less than, okay. So in this particular instance, what we can see is uh, given liquid limit, we can come up and we can select an appropriate drain friction angle uh, for our softened cases. So these would be for normally consolidated or moistened clays. We can look at a similar figure, but this time for residual uh, strengths of clays, okay? And you can see they're much much lower. I mean, look at, look at these numbers. For the clays that have uh, more than 50% clay fractions, we're talking on the order of like 5 to 8 degrees. Uh, that's the friction angle. So that's some really low strengths. And you can see why it could be really dangerous to design to 20, 25 degrees when your soil uh, actually may only have 8 or seven or six degrees of friction angle. Um, it, it can be really, really dangerous. So here's some tips that I will give to you and hopefully they'll be helpful to you. Uh, do we use peak, softened, or residual friction angles for our drained or our effective stress 
analysis. Okay, use the peak angle and its corresponding cohesion value if and only if you know the soil will permanently remain unsaturated. In other words, you have a drainage plan in place. You know that that soil is not going to get wet or saturated. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I know very few engineers, if any, who are willing to place their professional reputation on this guarantee. So it's risky. Um, uh, more common is if we're just dealing with temporary uh, conditions, maybe during construction or a facility that's going to be there one to two years maximum. Uh, for that instance, go ahead, use the peak angles. Um, the chances for long-term failure for these temporary structures is, is uh, significantly reduced because the structures won't be there very long. Okay, use your softened friction angle and zero cohesion drain cohesion if you're dealing with excavated slopes or the long-term stability of any soil slope that you think might become fully moistened. And uh, for most cases, this is going to be the case. Um, so you're, you should be using the softened friction angle a lot. Definitely much more than the peak friction angle in design. Okay, what about the residual friction angle? Use the residual friction angle and a cohesion of zero if you believe that large strains could be possible in this soil. Uh, anytime you're dealing with a landslide or anytime you're dealing with the potential for earthquake-induced displacements because both of those can generate large strains. And anytime you're dealing with repeated cyclic loading, because that loading just keeps going and going. It's like the Energizer Bunny. It just doesn't stop. So uh, you need to use the residual shear strengths for those cases, or at least evaluate that your system won't fail if you develop those residual strengths. So, Let's talk about another case history. This is a famous failure of, a, of an earthen dam um, on the upstream side of, uh, of the dam called the San Luis Dam in California. It failed after uh, running for and operating for 12 years. So people scratched their head over this saying, why did it fail after so long? That's so strange. Well, what they found when they went in and did their investigation was that the cyclic raising and lowering of the water level inside the dam um, increased and decreased the effective stress. And it caused the, uh, the development of a slick inside inside of the, um, inside of the soil of the dam, particularly at the base of the dam where there was, exists a highly plastic, stiff, and fissured clay slope wash, so clay-type soil. Fissured, heavily uh, over-consolidated fissured clay is particularly dangerous for the development of slick insides because the fissures are, are think of them as um, locations of, of preferential strain. Uh, the stress concentrates uh, on those cracks in the fissures and the water also enters the fissures and so it's very easy to develop slick insides when you have uh, these heavily over consolidated soils. So what we had was cyclic um, raising and lowering of the effective stresses and every time you raised and lowered those effective stresses you it caused a little bit of strain, just a teeny amount, every year, every season. And that strain was eventually enough for the particles, the soil particles, especially in that over-consolidated clay, to reorient themselves. And they formed a slick inside. Once they formed a slick inside, they had the residual drain shear strengths on the slick inside. Well, guess what? 
the slope stability was never evaluated for those residual shear strengths and the slope failed and no matter what they try to do to fix it it wouldn't be fixed because once you develop a slick inside it's not going anywhere those residual shear strengths will remain and so uh, this was a really unfortunate but but valuable case history for geotechnical engineers okay we're nearing the end I do want to talk about undrained shear strengths of clays so uh, in the undrained shear strengths of clays we know that there's going to be poor pressure effects um, we we know that uh, for over consolidated soils we're going to have negative pore pressures so our uh, strengths will increase in the short term for over or for normally consolidated soils we're going to have positive pore pressures and and contraction so uh, we're going to have a temporary decrease in the shear strengths of our soils uh, so these plots that I show here show typical behavior corresponding to undrained shear strengths of soils. Uh, you can see for over heavily over-consolidated soils, we get, um, uh, we usually don't see like a peak uh, shear strength. It almost looks like shear uh, strength hardening or strain hardening. Uh, but that's because the soil just keeps locking up. Uh, the more we shear it, the more negative pore pressures generate. And uh, it just adds more and more strength to the soil. For normally consolidated, we are going to see a strain uh, softening. There will be a peak and followed by a drop in the strength. Uh, the change in pore pressure, notice this isn't change in volume because it's undrained so it cannot change its volume but it can change the pore pressure for our heavily over consolidated soil we get negative pore pressures for our normally consolidated pore uh, soil we get positive pore pressures positive pore pressures are going to move our total stress more circle to the left negative pore pressures are going to move our total stress more circle to the right uh, and those will have an impact on our corresponding failure envelopes. Let's talk uh, about undrained, unconsolidated shear strength testing. Uh, and um, so UU triaxial test versus CU triaxial test. So let's do a hypothetical experiment. Let's, let's consider three UU triaxial tests performed on the same soil sample. So in this instance, the relative density is the same. We just have different um, confining uh, uh, stress, okay, uh, different cell pressures. And uh, as we as we test these different soils, they all show the exact same deviator stress at failure, okay? They're all the same um, for all three circles. So that leads us to believe then that if we, if we draw our failure envelope, that the failure envelope is flat, so we often say it has a phi equals zero. So we assume then that the shear strength of the soil is equal to the undrained shear strength, S sub u. We, we rack it all up to cohesion and we say that that's good. Here's the problem. If we were to do the exact same test in a CU test, it would be just one circle. one circle on the more Coulomb space. But how, wait, why is that? Why is it that all three of these circles are essentially the same test in the CU space? That's because when we close the drains and we crank the cell pressure in a UU test, any change in the cell pressure is going to cause a corresponding change in the pore pressure. So, if we look at the equation of effective stress, 
any change whoops any change in the cell pressure is going to be matched by an equal change in the pore pressure in the soil thus the effective stress has a net zero change and that's the detriment to not consolidating my soil sample and the initial stage of the triax test. So really what I'm doing, folks, is I am locking in to the soil sample in the UU test whatever effective stress was already existent in the soil before I started the test. So all of those UU tests were equal to one CU test at that same effective stress. So, what's the moral of this story? I prefer consolidated undrained triaxial testing. I do not recommend UU triaxial testing. So, why do we do it? Well, you know, it's quicker. It's easier in a lot of ways. But that leads to an interesting question. If I compare the undrained strengths from a CU test versus a UU test, the UU test is going to have me take the strength as uh, the max of the Mohr circle, the very top of the Mohr circle. If I use the CU test, it's going to tell me that the strength corresponds to whatever the value is where more circle touches the failure envelope. And that's always going to be a little less, a little lower than the top of the more circle. So, which is the true or the real shear strength of the soil? Is it the max shear stress at the top of the circle or is it the shear stress on the failure envelope? If you said the shear stress on the failure envelope, you were correct. It is the shear stress on the failure envelope. So why in the world would anybody ever use S sub U? Well, here's why. Um, when we measure S sub U in a UU test, S sub U underestimates TFF by up to, up to about 15% on average. And uh, there's lots of different reasons for that. There's uh, like the, uh, the rate of strain effects. The faster we strain something, the more uh, strength it has. There's uh, the initial uh, there's the, the initial effective stress issue that we may not have gotten the effective stress exactly where we wanted it to for the test. Um, there's also issues possibly of saturation involved in the test. Uh, all of these different factors, they can contribute to lower measured shear strengths in the UU test versus the CU test. So. That's why it works. I mean, it's S sub U is usually a conservative estimate of the shear strength of the soil. Personally, I recommend that you guys develop the uh, failure envelope, the real failure envelope of the soil using undrained shear strength testing uh, in CU triaxial versus UU triaxial. So that's the end of our lesson today. I hope that uh, this lesson was instructive to you and helps you understand a little bit more about the shear strength of clays. Feel free to leave any comments or ask any questions. Uh, and if I get a chance, I'll be happy to respond to those. But uh, for my students, feel free to come see me during office hours, shoot me an email or see me after class. Uh, we, I'll be happy to answer your questions about uh, this material as well. So uh, appreciate your attention and have a wonderful day.